Okay, um, so good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, do a quick review session, um, just a reminder about DBQs, just because we haven't written a DBQ in a while. So um, if you're watching on the video, I'm gonna kind of go back and forth between the whiteboard and what we have on the screen. I'll be able, I think, uh, share both um, at different times. So um, first, I just wanna remind us where we get points from with the DBQ, and then we'll look at an example of a DBQ. First place that we're going to get points for our essay is our intro paragraph. Um, we usually try to start our introduction paragraph with our contextualization. Contextualization is asking what else is happening. Um, and I underline the word help else because um, we don't necessarily want to talk about uh, uh, the focus of the essay. We want to talk about what else is going on. So um, if the question is asking us about our foreign policy, let's say during World War II and, and how we fought the war, um, the what else could be like what's happening in the United States, uh, how the home front changes over those few years. Um, so we want to kind of focus on what else is happening. We're trying to um, create the setting for the reader. Usually this is about three sentences. It begins the paragraph, and this is worth one point. And then I have to end the introduction paragraph. I don't have to end, I could begin with it, but usually we end with the thesis statement. The number one thing that the thesis statement does and has to do is answer the question. So if the only thing you read was that one sentence, does it answer the question? Um, and so what that might look like is um, if the question is asking, um, how much did life change after World War I, um, you would say something like, uh, life for Americans changed a lot or a little or not at all, right? By saying that, you're creating an argument um, and then you would give reasons why. Usually it would be three reasons Life changed a lot because of this reason, this reason, and this reason. And eventually, those three reasons will be your three body paragraphs. If you can, um, also try to put in a counter argument. Um, you're not going to lose points if you forget to put this in here, um, but it is a good way to remind yourself to put that in, and that's where you're going to get a point later. So that might look like if you want to uh, say that their life has changed after World War I a lot, you could say something like, um, while segregation still occurred after the war, life changed drastically for Americans because of blank, blank, and blank. Okay, you give a little counter argument at the beginning, well, this is true, and then you give your reasons why. And your thesis statement is also worth one point. Okay, so just doing the introduction paragraph without writing anything else, I've already earned two points. And then we have our body paragraphs. So our body paragraphs um, are, are where the majority of the points are going to come from. I'm going to write over here. There are seven documents to choose from. To get full points, you need to use six documents.
and they don't care where, right? In our last essay that we wrote, um, you had to write about, I think it was two categories. I think a lot of people at least wrote that, that essay, number two. Um, and so you would put three documents or three pieces of evidence in each body paragraph. That's fine. If you have a three uh, body paragraph essay, then you do two documents for each paragraph, right? So you have to use six and you get to decide where to put it. You usually don't want to have like five documents in one paragraph and one in the other. That's not good. Usually you want to try to even it out with six documents to get the full point. You also need to use somewhere outside evidence. So this is anything that's not directly um, discussed in an essay. So if there's no talk about the Scopes trial from the 1920s in any of the documents, you could use that as evidence. And you would just describe it and analyze it just like you would with the other documents. Although you don't have any quotes or anything to go off of, so you just have to go off of memory. So for your body paragraph, we always try to start with a topic sentence, um, and that just helps the reader to know what this paragraph is about. It's guiding your reader, and it should be about one of these reasons you talked about in your thesis statement, right? If you're giving an example of why uh, life has changed after World War I, this is one of those reasons. And then you start giving your evidence, like your document A, let's say. Um, to get these full points, we need to describe the main idea or like what the document is talking about. and then explain how it answers the question. So if our question is, how did life change? And let's say this document is about the Scopes trial. Um, I would say something like, um, you know, according to this letter written by John T. Scopes, um, he was accused of teaching evolution in the Tennessee high school, which was illegal in the 1920s. Right there, I just described it, right? I described what the document's saying and, it, and also what the Scopes trial was. I just described it. Then I say something like, this shows, or this is evidence that life has changed because there's conflict between religious fundamentalism and modern science, okay? That shows how it answers the question. If the question is, how did life change? Describe and explain. And then I do the same thing with document B. Describe, explain. If you can find one piece of evidence and do the describe and explain, that's perfect. Outside evidence, because I'm running out of room. Describe and explain it just like you would with the other document. Describe, explain. Questions so far? If you can do describe and explain for six documents, that is worth two points. If you can do, uh, use at least one piece of outside evidence to either describe and explain, that's worth one point. So if you're keeping track of home at home, we're at five points. There's two more to go. For tap analysis. Remember H stands for what? context. So that's what is happening when the document was made. It's a yep, intended audience. Who are they writing to?
these is um, yeah, point of view, perspective. Who is the creator of the document? And the last one is purpose. Now, with these questions, we cannot just um, take information from like the source line. Like if the document is written by Franklin Roosevelt, we can't just say Franklin Roosevelt made this document. Um, that's not enough. What they want to know with these is um, how does the answer to the question change the perspective or change the analysis of the document, right? If the question is talking about how life changed economically after World War I, um, we would read a document very differently if we knew it was from FDR or if it was from Hoover, right? Just by seeing the names of who made it changes our perspective on it completely. And so um, if you were writing about a document from FDR on the economy in the 1920s, you might say something like, um, FDR was a Democrat in the 1920s who um, believed there should be more government involvement in the economy, right? That's giving his point of view and tells us a little bit more about the document itself. And so I said before, when you're doing the documents, say document C, you describe it, you explain it, each of these are its own sentence, and then you do one of the H, A, P. So remember, you don't need to do all four. You can pick just one. And you have to do that for three documents. And by doing that for three documents, one point. Um, if you feel like your timing is good and you you don't feel like you're stretched for time, um, it might be good just to do four documents just in case one of yours wasn't good or you messed up or you realize the document was from somebody else and not who you thought it was for. It might be good just to do four documents from there um, just in case. So that's the second to last point. The last point is for the, um, the counter argument. Um, there are other ways you can get this point too, it's like modifying and qualifying the documents. And um, I, I think it's too complicated and they haven't described it very well. Um, I, I just think doing a counter argument is the easiest method to get this last point. Um, it's the point I think you should worry the least about uh, because it is more difficult to get than all the other ones. Um, but it is good to attempt it. And so um, if we're talking about how life changed after World War I, then you would talk about either how life stayed the same um, or you could even talk about how it changed in a different way that wasn't included in the article or the question. If the question is asking you, how did life change politically and socially during the 1920s? Um, you could go on and say, well, it also changed economically. It wasn't in the question, but I went and answered that anyway. You could talk about that, too. but the easiest I think is the same, like life stayed the same. And that one is worth one point. So I'm going to share my screen with uh, people on the on the video. Um, so this is an example question um, that is not going to be the one um, we use on the um, test for unit seven. Um, but it's one that 
comes about after World War One, and is a typical question we, we would see. Sorry, it's... That would be so great. Okay, so the question here is the 1920s have been characterized as a decade of economic, social, and cultural change. Analyze the extent to which the First World War and consumerism affected U.S. society during this period. So if you were writing this essay, you would have to talk about how um, this time period is changed because of the First World War and consumerism, economically, socially, culturally. So most likely, if I was looking at this article or this question, I would say, okay, I'm going to write an uh, a a um, paragraph about economic, social change. I think social and cultural are more too similar to each other. Um, if you can distinguish them, you could make three paragraphs. But I think looking at this, I would probably write an economic and a social paragraph. Um, Yeah, I'd probably write a social and economic paragraph. And then for each one of those documents that I'm putting in, I would say, okay, did this change happen because of the First World War or consumerism, right? Gave us that. First World War consumerism. So I'm looking at document A. We have an immigrant coming in. The document is showing that immigration restrictions have been opening the door. And so he's an undesirable, he's got a bomb for a head and um, he's being let in. And so my change would be that um, immigration is opening up in the 1920s. And um, then I look at the First World War consumerism. I believe this change, or at least the anti-immigration feelings, happens because of World War I. So I'd say something to the effect of, there are a lot of discussions about immigration that led to things like quotas or restrictions against immigrants. Okay. That's the, well, I don't have it written down anymore. That's the describe. And then to explain how it answers the question, I would say this happens because of first, the First World War and the fears of um, communism and radicalism after the war. And then if I want to, I could even do half analysis. Um, I think the easiest one for this one would be point of view. Is this person for or against imperialism or uh, immigration? Yeah, they're against immigration. So I could talk about um, this person is, or the author is clearly against immigration because they portray an immigrant as a person who has a bomb and is undesirable. So that gives a point of view of, of this document. We do, you can come in if you want. We're just having a review session. And so that's how I'd write that. Um, now, you might want to see when you're reading the documents, there could be ones that you don't even have to read. Um, if you, I don't know if there's one in here, but if there's a document and you see it's written by, um, like for our next, uh, our next essay, if you saw a document written by, I don't know, Charles Lindbergh, that's a good one. If it's by Charles Lindbergh, you probably know what it's about without even reading it. It's probably going to be about isolationism, the American First Committee. I don't even need to write it or read it. And so maybe you skip it. Um, you can still use it because you probably know what it's, it's about. Uh, maybe you could skim it. Um, but that might help to avoid the amount of time it takes to deeply read all of these. Sometimes you get articles and documents, you're like, ooh. I have never heard of Thorstein Veblen before. Is that, I don't know who that is. Um, Fanny Hurst, you might have to read these. Okay. So, um, you do not have to do a conclusion paragraph. For this DBQ7 uh, essay, um, we'll be giving you the full time period to write it. Um, 
but I will be kind of uh, suggesting like, hey, just so you know, it's been a half an hour, it's been one hour, because in May, the hope is that you can read the documents and write your essay in one hour. Okay. Any questions for me at all? Yes. Um, if you wanted to just write your Um, yeah, yep. I think so. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the, the questions worded a little weird on this one. Um, because they give three categories here and then two categories there. I think you could write write it either way. Yep. Here's here's a bunch of the uh, problems that came from the First World War in one paragraph. Here's a bunch of problems that came in because consumerism. Yep, I think that's cool. Okay, great. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know, everybody. Um, DBQ essays on Tuesday and Wednesday this week.